Uh, Professor Orlin. Uh, um, I'm fascinated. So, are you telling me that if the Supreme Court of the United States had decided that computer programs are not subject to copyright protection, as they could have, that Microsoft would not have had any monopoly or any leveraging or any anything? Well, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'll yeah. add a, 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 you know, a question that has a family resemblance. Is there an inconsistency between your proposal on remedies and your observation about the proprietization of open standards? Because if Microsoft is free to create derivative works that are then protected, then doesn't that allow them to create a perpetual cascading monopoly, even with a five-year term? Yeah. It might. I mean, to answer the second question first, it well might. You could imagine a sufficiently fleet-footed monopolist that once it had achieved the first thing, was using that five years very quickly to move everybody to the next generation and keep them locked in in this scrolling five-year period. Drug, drug companies do that all the time. Yeah. But realize that first, well, you could shorten the term slightly if need be. Like yeah. Every five years, it could be shorter. And also realize, I do credit Bob's point, that at some point, new technology is competing with the entrenched old technology. And if you actually get old technology that is abandoned by the person that has a proprietary interest in it precisely to force you to move up, I'm sorry, you got a new printer. Windows 3.1 doesn't have a driver for that. You're going to have to upgrade now to Windows 95 if you want to use that new printer, that new monitor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you imagine it suddenly springing into the public domain five years hence, I actually think you'd get a lot of recycling. You'd get Windows 3.1 that does have the new printer drivers, that does have actually a fighting chance in even the new marketplace. At least it would be a worthy uh, experiment to find out. Okay. Now, uh, what about my question? Nothing. I your question. My question was the Supreme Court. Oh, not. yes. Now, had the Supreme Court said, by the way, copyright doesn't apply to computer software, of course, the immediate question would be, well, how about patent? <laughs> no, no yeah. patent, no copyright. No, no patent, no copyright. No, yeah, nothing that the Constitution right. gives Congress the power right. to protect. There would be two possibilities. Possibility number one is, I see, we're on our own. We're not getting the guard dogs and the machine guns from the government to protect our monopoly, our IP monopoly that everybody shares. Uh, but what it will do then is, we'll lock it up really tight which is to say, we will guard the source code to Microsoft Windows as if it is the secret formula to Coca-Cola or Kentucky Fried Chicken. Precisely. And then, right. We will lock it up, and then we will release the compiled software only, and we'll put in bombs and traps, so if you try to decompile it, it won't work, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I would say, actually, some IP protection is better than none, because the IP protection can actually be the bargain. Yes, but my question was, what if you eliminated? Right. Well, and that's my answer, yes. then. The answer is, you might lock it up tightly. But my call was not to eliminate IP protection, but merely to recast the bargain so that you're taking away the out years that I posit are not even of particular value to the uh, IP holder in the technology realm, but at the same time, uh, in exchange for giving them the five-year monopoly that you give them, you actually require that they not have all the bombs or that they release the source code. It's similar to the way with patents. And what do you do about the bootstrap copyrights? With no, you know, slight improvements. 6.1 is a new pro is a new composition. Uh, don't you can't. That sounds fine. So long as I can use 6.0, uh, fine. You get another few days on 6.1. Uh, Bob. Um, I think you have something to say about this. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I have, I have lots to say, but I'll stick to this, this one topic for the moment, because uh, I know others have a lot to say as well. Um, I suggested that, uh, that the government should not be requiring uh, Microsoft to license its uh, source code, because after all, this is Microsoft's property, and Jonathan's res response is the only reason this is Microsoft's property is because the government has created uh, a proprietary right of Microsoft to possess this property. I say that's baloney. Microsoft doesn't have uh, an intellectual property protection like they would under the patent laws. If you think Microsoft has a protected monopoly, ask yourself how Macintosh came up with an operating system or Unix or, or BOS or, or, or Linux. There's no protected monopoly here. Copyright law allows independent creation. And there are plenty of people out there that are engaged in, uh, in, in the independent uh, uh, creation. As a matter of fact, um, uh, if you look at the Linux, it's now available as an operating system on 
uh, which is announced in January on Silicon Graphics PCs. It's available, announced in February on IBM uh, PCs, uh, Hewlett Packard and Dell servers. Oracle and Intel are now investing in Linux startup companies, Red Hat and VA Research. Haven't these people heard that Microsoft has a protected monopoly? We're confusing here copyright law with patent law. Microsoft's monopoly is not protected. Uh, Rick, let me uh, just make uh, a, a couple of points. Um, I, I would not necessarily be uh, for uh, any uh, reduction in intellectual property protection, but it, it probably has uh, nothing to do with this. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the right uh, uh, copyright term is, but primarily the reason that uh, one has to worry about copyright protection in this area is because of the large amount of pirating of software essentially to use it without paying somebody for it as opposed to uh, somebody using or essentially doing something to clone the software. Remember Dr. Doss, uh, which, about which there is a lawsuit that will begin in June, was basically a cloned version of MS-DOS. Um, and it wasn't really, it, to go to, um, uh, to Bob's point, it wasn't really the copyright laws that prevented that. Um, and, you know, it may be that if you, if you uh, today came out with Windows 3.2 that uh, somebody would buy it, but part of the reason that Microsoft does what it does with Windows 98 and Windows 2000 is because there are new things that one can take advantage of, like the Internet, like uh, expanded uh, capacity and speed of PCs, um, that frankly really wasn't feasible back in Windows 3.1. And Gates has pointed out, uh, testified, uh, as your students heard, Professor Orland, uh, uh, back in this Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, that essentially um, all of the code in Windows operating systems is completely replaced within a six-year cycle. So none of the code that you would see in a Windows product today essentially existed six years ago. Um, so, I mean, maybe, uh, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not prepared to say that five years is uh, uh, is long enough, because I doubt if it is, but I do think that timing is probably not the issue here because things do move so rapidly. And frankly, from Microsoft's standpoint, um, while they still do sell copies of Windows 3.1 and, and that sort of thing to corporate users who essentially have legacy systems and they want you know, new PCs and they don't want to uh, upgrade all their PCs to another system, um, from Microsoft's standpoint, the competition that's really driving it is the ability to make uh, new operating system products that take advantage of technical opportunities that are out there today uh, or out there in the future that weren't there uh, a year ago, much less five years ago. And so, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting issue, but I'm, I'm not quite sure that it would resolve all the problems, and I'm not sure that the problems that it would create uh, essentially have been addressed here today. Uh, Bert? Um, I have no idea where to, which points to hit on, but here are a couple that uh, occurred to me. Uh, number one was uh, John's uh, remedy for the Microsoft case. I failed to see its relevance. Uh, what are you going to do? Ask Congress to take over the case and legislate a new framework for all software? I mean, you, you've given us your reasons why all of the remedies don't work, including the remedy of no remedy, and then tossed it, tossed it out. So maybe you could just take a, an answer to how does this fit in? I just didn't catch it. I guess I'm trying to take a look at the big picture and not just answer the problem such as it is. It's interesting to hear Rick describe there being problems. Um, but the problem such as there is of Microsoft today and actually take the longer view to say whatever remedy may come up with. And I agree, for the case at bar, particularly if Congress were suddenly to hastily convene and change uh, IP law, and then you'd have all sorts of retroactive takings issues and things like that. So, okay, maybe you've got to somehow wiggle your way through with some remedy that is the least terrible of all the ones that I describe as bad for the case at bar. But I guess my view was taking the long view prospectively to not set us up to have this recurrent problem 
uh, just change the entire structure of how it works, uh, and it'll be quite quite better. Okay, I can understand where you're going. I just didn't see how it yeah. solved the problem. I mean, I... on that, there is a amorphous doctrine floating out there called patent misuse, uh, and I think on occasion copyright misuse. And if you use a patent in a way to violate the antitrust laws, certain consequences can flow. I never viewed, but perhaps it's because I, I wasn't properly attuned to the software copyright issue, I never viewed uh, the Microsoft case and the, and the claimed misconduct and the charges of misconduct as primarily a copyright issue. But if it were, and the question was how do you solve this case, there are misuse handles that a court could turn to to apply the kinds of thinking you're uh, proposing in this particular case. Um, may, may, I, may I take back the floor? Uh, I'll, I'll yield to the gentleman in a moment. Same, same issue? I just had is, is it the same of... issue we're talking about? Yeah, it, I just want to throw out, I, I think the, the main method for protecting software uh, in the industry is, is trade secrets, not copyright. Uh, most um, confidentiality agreements that, we, that I do for my clients have a time horizon of five years, and they're perfectly happy to live with that. Um, the way engineers develop source code and uh, build on e existing source code is is to look at it, and source code is protected through tra trade secret, not pro uh, copyright. So I I'm interested in, in, you must have gotten feedback from engineers in about this proposal, have you, jo Jonathan? I've been circulating around. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to know how you, I mean, I can see how you can constrict copyright law for new programs, um, but to, in order to enforce some sort of release of trade secret, secret that would take a, an affirmative action on part of the government, basically telling Microsoft that they have to divulge these secrets, and that's, that's more, that would be more along the lines of, uh, what Bob was saying about uh, ex mis misappropriation right. or expropriation. Right. I'd be saying they only have to release the secrets as part of a bargain. If they want the protection, we don't know what we're calling it now. Maybe it's some kind of new copyright, something else. If they want the government's protection for that five-year period, then they're going to have to deliver some things to the government, much as patent works. And it says, you know, it may be a trade secret right now, and, and maybe you have to embargo it with the government for the five years, and the end of five years, out it pops. Uh, so it doesn't seem to me fatal to the idea to imagine that it's treated that way. Also notice, I think you echo something that Rick was saying, which was, it's not the goose stupid, it's the golden eggs. We don't care how many geese get copied, it's just the eggs, the pirating of the software that we care about. But of course, the moment you have the goose, which I'm taking to be the source code, then you can generate as many eggs as you want. And uh, the problem of software piracy, of course, piracy itself defined as the stealing of somebody else's intellectual property, I mean, by the time the time is up, it's no longer piracy. It's either taking the goose and making as many eggs as you like or buying your eggs from any number of producers who have identical geese laying them to completely bludgeon the metaphor into the ground. <laughs> and we expect anybody in the future to carry his metaphor on to the end of the <laughs> afternoon. But, okay. Additional uh, speaking. Yeah. A couple more uh, scatter shots then. Uh, one question of, of private property as as Bob uh, describes it and creates a, what sounds like a fairly logical framework, I would just emphasize that it's totally contrary to Anglo-American uh, history uh, toward uh, Adam Smith and his concept of the role of monopoly toward our ability to do anything whatsoever if, uh, if let's say, a horizontal price fixing in the most collusive manner, we would not be able to penalize it because that would be taking away somebody's private property. I mean, it is a it is a, a logical kind of a viewpoint, but it's very foreign to the one that we're dealing with. I think um, you may care to say something about that, uh, and then I'll get back to one last point. Yeah, let me let me take you up on Adam Smith because I love when this comes up. I really do. Adam Smith's quote that everybody uh, references is this from The Wealth of Nations. People of the same trade seldom meet together, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. And people assume that that means, of course, that Adam Smith must be in favor of vigorous enforcement of the antitrust laws. But the very next sentence in The Wealth of Nations, which you almost never hear quoted, is this. 
It is impossible indeed to prevent such meetings by any law which either could be executed or which would be consistent with liberty and justice. So I don't think you can convoke Adam Smith as a believer in the antitrust laws. <laughs> Well, there's a very interesting book out about uh, the life of uh, Adam Smith and how his, his views fit in with uh, his, uh, his other views of uh, moral philosophy. I think Mueller, is that the name of the fellow? It's about three years old, which uh, I would recommend. It gives another viewpoint on, uh, on Smith from somebody who is a, a great fan of Smith. Um, consumer harm. Can we touch on that for a second? Because uh, I just want to make sure that before Professor Page leaves, if you have something... That's what I was going to say. So if you'd okay. like to talk about that, go ahead. Consumer harm? Uh, okay. I, I don't want to let go by that there's no sense of consumer harm in this case. Uh, it seems to me that it has been developed by the government in several different ways. Uh, number one, um, prices of Windows has gone down over this period of time, but it has not gone down anywhere near as rapidly as price of comparable uh, hardware and software, uh, according to some of the testimony that was presented. And, and indeed, uh, people inside Microsoft were celebrating the fact that they had raised quite substantially the percentage uh, of the cost of, of uh, Windows to, to the cost of the overall system. So consumers have lost, apparently, uh, the difference uh, that might have occurred in the absence of uh, the monopoly. Um, quite uh, theoretically, at least, uh, and evidence has come in uh, as to the theory, uh, the impact on innovation that is likely to occur if, if in my scenario of, of uh, Microsoft going going on and the um, certainly the monopoly from hell scenario, um, you would lose innovation, which would have a major impact on everybody. And the explanations for that were given, which included the uh, how venture capitalists would react and the likelihood that um, funding for competitive and innovative types of activities would dry up or be channeled in such a way that only a very limited uh, kind of innovation occurs. This is relatively theoretical, and I don't think evidence was provided that, that it had actually uh, occurred. So it's, it's sort of a weakness in the case, but it's not an absence. It's not as if uh, the arguments haven't been produced. It's something that hasn't really been seen yet. Uh, and I think there are people who will tell you that it has been seen. I'm just not able to, to cite any uh, song and verse on that. Rick, oh, sorry. Rick wanted to say one thing just because he's got to catch a plane and momentarily. Uh, let me, yeah, and I wanted to just, just respond real quickly to Bert and maybe some other people will uh, protect uh, uh, me after I'm gone. But um, uh, the, um, that's right. the, the notion that it, it's always struck me as very odd that the strongest claim of monopoly power and, uh, and harm that, for example, Rick Warren Bolton, who uh, I will tell you was my dep deputy, the economics deputy when I was the head of the division, uh, 10 years can make a lot of difference in a human as well as a piece of software. Um, he basically testified that the reason that uh, there was pro a problem was this point that, uh, uh, that Bert made, that basically the portion of the cost or the price of the PC made up by the operating system has gone up as a percentage uh, uh, over the last 10 years. Well, what he doesn't quite say is, one, he's looking only at the price of the operating system. He's not controlling for quality, and that was kind of uh, uh, the point that Bob was making, that if you actually look at the functionality in the operating system, uh, what you get today when you get Windows 98 would have cost you many times more uh, only five years ago. But second and more significantly, it's a very odd notion. It's like saying um, the, uh, you know, the price of, uh, of uh, automobiles uh, during the same period uh, has gone up uh, when Microsoft uh, stayed about the same, and therefore that must be an indication that somehow Detroit has gained m uh, market power over the same period of time. The fact is that what you're comparing when you compare an operating system with a microprocessor or hardware is really uh, comparing apples and oranges. 
that what drives uh, costs to go down or prices to go down for semiconductors, for microprocessors, and that sort of thing, in large part is the law of physics, so-called Moore's law, which uh, ena enables you to put more information through shorter distances and you know uh, over a period of time. And that's what kind of drives those prices down. The same thing is true when you're talking about hardware that tends to be relatively stable and over through learning curve um, uh, effects and economies of scale, you drive the price down. Software is much different. Over time, you've got to continue to invest human capital uh, to, to maintain it. That human capital goes up because of all of the software uh, uh, engineers who are increasingly in demand. Uh, so the costs don't move in the same way, and it's simply a reflection of differences in costs, not any, any reflection of uh, monopoly power. And finally, on the point of, of innovation, I mean, I've sat in, in the courtroom, as I said, for the last six months, and basically the government's case on innovation comes down to this. Netscape, before Microsoft came in with a really good product, was earning additional revenues on its browser. It no longer can charge for its browser, and therefore that revenue no longer exists. And if Netscape had been able to continue to earn that revenue, it would have been able to invest more in innovation. Well, that's a very odd notion for the antitrust laws. It basically says that we really shouldn't subject companies to competition because then they won't have as much in the way of profits to invest in new technology. Um, and that strikes me as a very protectionist approach, what Bill Baxter used to call the cash flow theory of innovation. Uh, basically, the reason you innovate is because you see an opportunity in the future that you hope to gain uh, uh, value for. And the notion that somehow venture capital has dried up is ludicrous. I mean, there are double the number of companies out there writing software that there were five years ago. Uh, and the amount of investment that is put into this industry is huge. And a large part of the reason that that investment is made is because a lot of ISVs can execute their ideas efficiently, in part because of the standardization and the consistency of the platform that's out there called Windows and the operating systems that ISVs can rely on without having to reduplicate the wheel every time they write a piece of software. So I think that the evidence that's in the record about consumer harm is non-existent, frankly. And as I said uh, earlier this morning, and I will leave you with the note, that I think that is the fundamental flaw uh, and whole in the government's case. Professor uh, do you have something there? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I suppose it's, it's related to, um, to Rick's point. Um, I agree um, with Jonathan that Microsoft has a competitive advantage in uh, the installation of its browser at the OE, through the OEM channel. There's no question about that. Um, as it stands now, uh, that benefit, that, that advantage is the result of providing an unequivocal consumer benefit of a state-of-the-art browser. Uh, now, if we were to remove that, and I know you're not proposing that, but if we were to say that Microsoft is required to allow OEMs to delete the browser or to delete access to the browser, then, in effect, the primary function of that would be to transfer the property right, a property right, to the OEM. Uh, in effect, now they have the right to sell uh, uh, space on the desktop to Netscape. Uh, they would, uh, if Windows, were, if Microsoft were not permitted to, uh, in effect, uh, require that uh, Internet Explorer also be on the desktop, uh, then OEMs would have the much more valuable property right of selling exclusive access to the desktop. And I'm not sure the consumers are better off in that, in that world. Um, I'm, I'm more troubled about this issue of whether, you know, welding the browser to the operating system and, in effect, preventing consumers easily from removing it uh, is uh, consumers. And, and I would include in that corporations that have large numbers of, uh, of, uh, of computers and they would like to have a single browser. Uh, I, I have somewhat more problem with that, and I think there is evidence that there are end consumers who would prefer not to have Internet Explorer on their system. In fact, uh, some of you may know there's a, there's a website out there, 98life.net, which I suggest you go to, that uh, allows you to download a program that takes off the uh, 
Windows 98 shell and reinstalls the Windows 95 shell on top of Windows 98. So what you get is essentially Windows 95 plus all the bug fixes in Windows 98 and the Windows 95 interface without Internet Explorer. And apparently there are a minimum number of, uh, uh, of problems with it. So uh, that tells me that there are, you know, there are people out there who don't want it. Uh, I'm not sure. I have a problem, though, with requiring even a monopolist uh, to offer alternate versions of its product um, or to tell it how, what sort of options to offer to consumers. And, and I, see, I see cost in the remedy, but I'll, I'll shut up now. I just wanted to take issue with one thing. As far as I can tell, it's not a property right in the desktop. The reason why, for example, in the 95 litigation, you could have the IE logo appear there and force the uh, OEM like Dell to pass it on to the consumer was because it was a contract right. It was a right that was established as part of licensing of the system. If there was not that epiphenomenal contract on top of the exchange, once you get the copyrighted product, unless you're going to say it's making an illegal derivative work, you could remove the icon. And it's just like getting a copy of the New York Times ripping out the front page and then selling the results to somebody else. I mean, that's not a property right in the New York Times not to have its front page not torn off by somebody who then resells it. Microsoft, Microsoft says otherwise. Yeah. Well, Microsoft, Microsoft can say, say it. indeed it is a copyright protection. Right. But if they right. were permitted to remove it, could Microsoft then compete to buy back the, their installation of it on the... Uh, in other words, sure. they that would be say, freedom of all right, we'll give you, uh, we'll, we'll sell you Windows at uh, $75 if you'll just leave Internet Explorer on there. Uh, it depends. It depends on what you would, what, what would end up being the definition of are you conditioning the licensing of a covered product of, say, Windows 95 on the acceptance and installation uh, of uh, something like IE. But it's still, it's, it's contract. It's not property. Question from the audience, Professor? Um, I'm extremely confused by, by all of this. Um, I, having, I'm, I'm, I, I was with Jonathan uh, almost all the way. Um, the browser wars are over. Uh, I'm, I'm even willing to go further that Java is over because I've tried programming it and it's just impossible. <laughs> um, so the puzzle is, the, 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 the next step is the, the distributed computing, basically the next Java which will do it fast instead of slow and uh, with, with ease instead of clumsiness. Um, and what I would like to see is how does the, that next step of the technology get impeded by anything that Microsoft has done or helped by anything that Microsoft has done. I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to accept that they, their, their monopoly power puts them in the driver's seat. Right. But are they, are they pressing the gas pedal or are they pressing the brake pedal uh, in this new technology? I don't know. That, um, it's, no one has talked about this. Right. Right. I, I think I'd agree with Rick that Microsoft has been consistently innovating. They are not the typical lazy monopolist with their feet up on the desk puffing a cigar and just, you know, hoping that the world you know, doesn't change. They keep innovating. I grant them that. So then the question is, presuming we're going to get to some new world of distributed computing, et cetera, et cetera, how does their current position help them? And uh, to me, the answer is you don't have what engineers call flag day where everybody at one point throws out all their old computers and picks up new ones. And if you had a flag day, you wouldn't have to worry about backwards compatibility because everybody would be upgraded at the same instant in time. Of course, the quaint days of flag days are long past. And as a result, the new boss in town is going to bear, I think, a lot of lineage to the old boss to the extent that remnants of the old systems are able to be deployed to help create the new ones. I mean, Windows 3.1, I would not underestimate the boost that Windows 3.1 got because it always had that DOS shell in it, or DR DOS, but you could buy Windows without having to install it and forget about any of your DOS programs. You could still run them in the DOS shell. And similarly, to the extent that Windows 2000 or whatever other operating systems you're talking about are grounded with some form of backwards compatibility to the old proprietary monopoly, 
that is quite an advantage. Can you speak into the microphone? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what I was saying was that those that are operating. No, you're systems, excited, but it's. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the competition in operating systems, while the next technology is the distributed computing, which, if it keeps the shape of the virtual machine and interpreter that sits between the operating system and the program, will be can be written by anybody, as the virtual machines are are written by several people. Yes, yeah. and I'm only suggesting that the virtual machine that predominates, that's going to be the new boss. One example of this war over whose virtual machine will be the virtual machine is the battle between Netscape and their version of Java and IE and the Java virtual machine that Microsoft has cooked up. And if Microsoft, and I again I credit, Microsoft Java is better, okay, I credit that as well, but it's also different. In addition to being better, it's got these hooks in it such that it makes it so that people who write for this new virtual machine are writing now for a closed proprietary Microsoft product, not for an open standard system. And if that's the critical mass you end up getting, people write for the closed product because that's what most people have most accessible on their desktops because after all they've got IE now, then you are into the next cycle. Uh, and again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate the difference between the proprietary system uh, and the open one. I mean, imagine if 90% of our food and water uh, came from processes that were closed. You don't know what the additives are. You look at the label. You don't know the ingredients. It just says, trust us. Uh, I actually think there's an issue at some point, uh, given the lifeblood the technology is for our society, uh, of wanting to structurally wonder uh, if you want to be favoring through law proprietary over open. Uh, Bob? I'd like to pick up a couple of miscellaneous things that tie into some of the things that have been discussed. Uh, discussed. First, uh, in the area of price changes for software, I certainly agree with Rick that there's no particular reason why software prices should change by the same magnitude or, or even by the same percentage that hardware prices change. Uh, the two markets are completely different. They just happen to have a common customer base upon occasion. But the economics of the two industries are quite different. But if we look at software alone, there's been a lot of work done in this area. Excel, for example, is now uh, uh, more expensive than Lotus, it's true. But the important thing is that when Lotus was the market leader, Excel and Lotus were selling for right around $150. Now that Excel is overwhelmingly the market leader, instead of $150, it's $50. There's been a lot of work done by Leibowitz and Margolis in this area. And let me tell you what they found out. Prices rose 35% uh, in the word processing market when WordPerfect was the dominant word processor. Uh, they've fallen 75% since Microsoft Word uh, took the lead. Uh, but uh, uh, more importantly, um, with respect to software prices generally, there have been sh sharper declines by far in markets where Microsoft has a product. 65% price declines in Microsoft in areas where Microsoft has a product uh, than in markets where Microsoft does not have a product, 15%. Um, on another issue, Jonathan said that I would, I would be suggested I might be apoplectic about uh, about open uh, uh, protocols. I, I have no problem at all with open protocols. The difference is uh, between those that are spontaneously created and those that are created as a result of uh, government coercion. Uh, he also mentioned, by the way, that, uh, that the real reason for um, the advantage uh, that Microsoft has is because of these uh, uh, first screen problems. Of course, none of that explains uh, uh, how it is that Microsoft Network was a big failure, or how it is that Quicken hasn't been able to be uh, to have been overcome by uh, by money. Uh, it doesn't explain how come um, um, Windows, uh, when it tied in on the first screen, Internet Explorer one and two, uh, did not gain market share. Netscape had a 90% share of the market all during the period that Windows, uh, uh, that Internet Explorer 1 and 2 were tied to the operating system. It was only when Inter Internet Explorer 3.0 came out, and even after it came out, when PC magazines began reviewing the product favorably, and then later when consumers decided that this was indeed better, and apparently Jonathan now agrees that Internet Explorer 5.0 is a good deal better. It was only at that time that Microsoft's market share, the browser market, uh, exploded. But to suggest that Netscape, by the way, is no longer a player, I mean, bear in mind, they still have 58% of the market when you add in uh, the 16% that they're going to get as a result of the uh, AOL deal. And, and the last uh, thread that I want to pick up is, uh, is Jonathan's comment that uh, he thinks software may be drying up uh, for 
uh, uh, venture capital uh, might be drying up for software firms because of Microsoft's uh, dominance. Let me read you a quote from uh, from Andreessen, the Netscape's uh, technology officer, who's now with uh, AOL, of course. And this is a quote that was uh, just made uh, recently in the New Yorker magazine. They're smart, this is a quote, they're smart money, dumb money, corporate money, Japanese money, pension money. If you have a decent idea, uh, getting funded isn't that hard. Uh, Price Waterhouse uh, determined that software was the number one recipient of venture capital money uh, during calendar year 1997. So I think it's hardly suggested that venture capital money isn't flowing into software operations. Questions from the I had a, a question for the, the panel. Uh, uh, Professor Page had talked extensively about the, the, the DC Circuit opinion uh, uh, and its relationship to what's going on now. Um, as a practical issue, you have Judge Jackson going through the trial. Does anything that he does matter in terms of what the DC Circuit would do depending on which the panel uh, uh, is is uh, is assigned, depending on whether it's on bank review, and then is it likely, in light of what's going on, assuming there's no resolution, of course, that uh, the Supremes are likely to take this case up on cert and resolve a monopolization case uh, in the uh, first part of the 21st century? Yeah, 30 seconds. For that. Well, uh, I, the D.C. Circuit did indicate that they uh, thought their standard was consistent with tying law, and, and uh, Judge Jackson, in his uh, uh, opinion denying summary judgment, uh, indicated his disagreement with their standard for finding integration, but said that with misgivings, that appears to be the standard that he will have to apply. Nevertheless, he observed that the, the D.C. Circuit did say that it's subject to reevaluation on a, on a more complete factual record. So that's the, that's the way it went in on the integration issue. All the other issues, of course, are wide open, and that's, that's why uh, uh, the, the bullying issues uh, relating to you know, bad conduct and uh, the, attempt, the attempt to monopolize uh, in the famous meeting on June 21st, 1995, uh, the various contracts with Internet firms, um, all of those things remain open. So, do, do you, any of you agree or disagree with what I think was Rick's comment that in order for the government to prevail, the rules have to change? Professor Rowan? Yeah, I don't think the rules have to change in response. I think, I, I, but I don't think it's also, it is not possible to intelligently give, give an informed answer to your question about whether the district court judge uh, uh, matters. I think it, it's easy to say intuitively, and I feel it intuitively, that the likelihood is that there will be a loss by the, uh, in the district court and a reversal uh, in the uh, D.C. Circuit, uh, and who knows what in the Supreme Court, but I don't really know that, and it really depends on what kind of opinion uh, uh, factually uh, and, and theoretically uh, the district court comes up with. Uh, it, it, he could come up uh, uh, with an opinion on Section 2 liability completely circumventing the, the, the problem that the D.C. Circuit has already ruled on uh, of the tie-in, and, and apart from the tie-in, fashion uh, uh, a theory of Section 2 liability, and as to that, prediction in the D.C. Circuit, I think... No, I am, my, implicit in my question, of course, is the, the issue that antitrust courts at the district court level uh, are not provided, at least in my experience, uh, do not uh, get any deference from appellate courts. And, 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 uh, I've used, used mentioned that. I, and, I and it's, al that. And it's, almost, it's almost de novo, in my view, in, in many of the situations. Uh, are you suggesting it'd be if Judge Jackson makes uh, opinions carefully crafted to reflect uh, his view of the credibility of witnesses, where we have all these conflicts? Uh, don't you think he's going to get uh, the credit for the credibility judgment? I think it's going to be very difficult for the appellate court to overturn his factual findings, and the factual findings may very well dictate uh, legalistic holdings that are not at all a stretch of where we've been in the past. Um, secondly, we don't know what panel 
of the appellate court will hear this, and it may not be two to one uh, Reagan Republicans. Uh, who knows? Thirdly, uh, I, just to speculate a little on the uh, process that we're going to see, um, we're not sure what what will how it's going to be uh, carried out. The judge has a lot of discretion. I think he's going to find make findings of liability first and then go into remedy phase in which he takes evidence, and that could be a prolonged phase, but uh, I sort of think that's the logical way to go simply because it's too difficult to fashion a remedy uh, or talk about a remedy or take evidence on a remedy until you know uh, what he finds the law to be in this case. Uh, there is some possibility of, of seeking an expedited uh, hearing at the Supreme Court. People think that's a low probability, but the uh, case could be certified up uh, and possible. It's possible. It's happened. Uh, and this is a big enough case, uh, as we've been de describing it, it's important enough that possibly that would happen. I don't think the odds are in favor of it, but I think it's worth trying. I think it's worth trying anything possible to get the liability uh, as established, if there is liability, uh, to a final judgment uh, as soon as we can before we spend a great deal of time and energy working out the remedy. Um, there may be some creative aspects that uh, can be worked on here. Um, it, it's interesting to note, in light of this discussion about how much deference the, uh, the trial court is going to get at the appellate level, that David Boyes, of course, I think realizes that his case on the law is pretty weak. And accordingly, he's pitched this whole case based on credibility of witnesses and, and disgorged uh, documents, 3.3 million pages of documents and, and emails, some of it from uh, lower-level staff employees, some of it taken out of context, but albeit some of it from, uh, from Bill Gates. And Bill Gates claims to get 37,000 pieces of email uh, each year, and the Justice Department is, is uh, complaining about his selective disclosure, which is really a mind-blowing thing coming from anyone connected with the Clinton administration. Um, but this point, I think, needs to be made about these emails and, and, uh, and documents. First, the, this purported meeting between Netscape and Microsoft, at which they, uh, Microsoft made an offer to carve up the market. The Justice Department had full notes on that meeting from Netscape's lawyer, Gary Reback, within 48 hours of the time that the meeting took place. And for three years, they did absolutely nothing about it. So why all of a sudden is it presumed to be an antitrust violation? The other thing to, to think about is that, uh, that uh, um, the antitrust laws punish conduct. They don't punish intent. Uh, so aggressive language in emails is not an antitrust violation. Uh, Judge Easterbrook on the uh, Seventh Circuit says to punish, to punish intent is to punish competition because uh, rivals, vigorous rivals, intend to defeat their competition. Now, that's, I think, a very useful lesson. Question for is it Professor Zittrain, or am I pronouncing it properly? That works for me. Aside from your uh, legislative solution that you proposed, if you were appointed as the special master, God forbid. Right, <laughs> unlike your colleague's uh, success. Um, what do you propose as the remedy, assuming liability has been established? It's funny. I was going to, it's too bad Rick left. The one question I wanted to ask Rick was, uh, presuming that Microsoft, uh, against your prediction and desire, was found uh, liable and you've been asked to put in an envelope your remedy from the Microsoft side and the government was going to do the same, the judge promised he would pick one, what would you put in that envelope? And of course he left, so I don't know. Um, I don't know what I'd do. I really don't. I, I'll tell you what I would do as a special master. I would settle in for a good few months and uh, take the testimony. Maybe I'd do the envelope trick. Uh, and then nobody could blame me for having to choose one of the two envelopes. If, if you had to decide between compulsory licensing on the one hand and open source, as has been touted recently, uh, which do you think would be uh, more optimal? Well, describe to me what you mean by open source. Open source would be essentially Microsoft shows its hand. It opens up its folders and says, this is what we have. If you don't use what I have here, you don't pay me anything. 
if you use some of my code, the X's and the O's, the ones and the twos, you've got to pay me a sliding uh, scale royalty, if you will. That, um, that's what I deem to be. Uh, sounds uh, awfully tough. Do you measure the code in pounds or in? Uh, you know? That's something that would have to be worked out, obviously. But as opposed to compulsory licensing, where there's an auction process, perhaps, and it's given over to uh, three to five uh, competitors. Not to dodge your question, I really have to think about it. Okay. I, I see the minefield that exists in both of them to imagine, even going forward, how you'd execute it, and if it would apply to the next version of Windows, too. I mean, how prospective would the remedy be? Thank you. If anybody else would like to opine on that, uh, certainly welcome. I agree with Jonathan. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, if, if you people want to stay for a few minutes, it's fine. I, I just, no one seems to be getting up and leaving, which is <laughs> one indication I've often used. Uh, professor? Um, let me reverse my position and say, okay, <laughs> I am complete, co completely convinced that m what Microsoft has been doing over the last few years has delayed our society's shift to the new technology of distributed computing. Um, I connect to the, my point connects to the previous question. That, um, what we have to, the remedy has to facilitate the shift to distributed computing. The remedy cannot be about operating systems because operating systems are a thing that is going to be fading out. So, um, where, how can we, the, the question has to be how can we accelerate, how can we make the remedy work to accelerate society's shift to uh, distributed computing? And, um, Given the the programming talent that uh, Microsoft has uh, gathered, it um, it's hard to believe that anything other than um, some arrangement that would take some of that talent and make it compete against its currently colleagues um, and provide them with similar incentives for the competition, which now they have their stock options and all this. Um, um, it's hard to imagine that any other uh, remedy would work. Um, if that is society's uh, loss, it's society's loss that has to be the, the remedy has to address. But, but so far, I think only you, perhaps playing the devil of advocate, and uh, and Larry Ellison from Oracle are the only two people in the United States who seem to think that distributing computing is the is the uh, uh, the uh, be all and end all. Um, he's certainly in favor of it. He's been in favor of it for years and been advocating it for years. But it turns out that the consumers haven't uh, haven't bought on to the idea. Now maybe it'll catch on. Maybe it won't. So when you say uh, what kind of remedy should facilitate this, I don't, I don't know why we should facilitate it at all. The remedy should be open up all of the competitive. Uh, uh, let all the competitive juices flow. Let all the firms uh, vie against one another. And if distributed computing wins out, then it will win out. Now, the, the way in which Microsoft has delayed distributed computing is to violate its licensing agreement with, uh, with Sun Microsystems and has polluted the uh, Java programming language. Then, by all means, I hope, I hope they sue each other, as they are doing, in fact. And I hope they, they can sue until the cows come home, as far as I'm concerned. May the, may the, uh, the company that's, that's in the right with respect to this license dispute prevail. But I don't know why that requires uh, government intervention. I just want to make a comment about Professor Zetrain's comments on criminal enforcement. Um, only because we put people in jail in this country if they have no market share at all. And two widget manufacturers with you know, two percent of the market nakedly fixed prices. We put them in jail for three years in Danbury, and yet, if you were uh, a monopolist, if you, if you accept, if you in the subjunctive, if one were a monopolist and acted with an intent to destroy competition and have a, a real effect upon uh, a relevant market, why should that be treated so less severely than maybe we shouldn't put people in jail for? Uh, having a de minimis market share and then agreeing to fix prices when 99% of the market is free to go buy a widget from somebody else. But uh, I don't, I, I see a disconnect there.
Yeah, I didn't necessarily mean to make a clarion call for amnesty for all antitrust violators. Uh, <laughs> agreed. I guess um, I do see some power uh, in Rick's point of the distinction between activities where you truly are in the smoke-filled room and conspiring with someone else to fix prices. I mean, there's something that may be, indeed, Malum and say about it, the way we've been kind of indoctrinated to think, uh, that may be uh, slightly harder to put your finger on uh, when you're talking about, uh, you know, single-person monopolization, bad behavior, uh, and people that are all going to try to walk that line as close as they can. And maybe that line exists even with the agreements. Too, yeah, at, at common law, as we, as we all know, in England, both were subject at some point to the death penalty. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, I just want to say, I'm not advocating that. But I actually, I mean, I, I think the real answer to this My is that... would be very, very yeah, troubling. So, I, I think the real answer to this is that the Microsoft case, in a very important respect, is a rhetorical entity. It's a case that is part of our culture, not just part of our jurisprudence and our technical doctrine. And to actually stand up and say, well, you know, this particular case went that way, so end of story, is really to miss the idea that really is kind of a referendum on uh, competition and the limits of it in America. And I think as uh, somebody, it might have been you, I don't mean to ascribe it to you though if it's not, uh, said earlier uh, that it's, it's something that has actually put antitrust front and center in the American public's mind in a way that it has not been including justifications for it at all, and you hear back and forth, should there be antitrust? I think it was uh, Byrd and, and Lenny that both made yeah. this comment. So. so as a rhetorical matter, uh, I wouldn't want to see the result uh, be that we're saying Bill Gates is a criminal. It, it, and I'm, again, this is not a legal judgment I'm making. It's truly a rhetorical and a cultural one. One more, and then I, we're going to retire. Just, Maybe just, just a uh, tiny thing on... Uh, criminality. Um, the contrast has been between people secretly meeting in smoke-filled rooms and presumably the openness of, of, of Microsoft. I, I think it is possible uh, to make an argument that until the litigations and the hearings and the common market uh, pushes, an awful lot of what Microsoft did was very secretive that people didn't know about the deep discounts, uh, uh, the coercion on OEMs, uh, 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 and uh, it doesn't have to be a smoke-filled room. I think there are indicia of secretive coercion, if you wanted to make that argument, uh, that you could make in the Microsoft uh, uh, case. If we didn't call it monopolization, but called it extortionate transactions, people would be more comfortable putting them in jail. So yes, just, that's right. We, we can debate this in a... In a Another symposium. Oh, filled room. Perhaps. Well, maybe in a smoke, yeah. <laughs> but, but not in the state of Connecticut, you're not going to do a smoke filled room, trust me. Um, but it's it's it would be illegal. Um, I, I just, I want to thank the speakers. I thought this was just terrific uh, perspective. Sorry, Rick could not be here at the end. And Professor Kravacek, who was planning to be here to the end for the Q&A, found that his plane to Europe, one of them, uh, was canceled, so he had to leave early to make sure that he got to Europe this evening. Uh, otherwise, he would have been here. So, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Wigan and Dana, and thanks again to the Connecticut Law Review for putting on what is just a spectacular day, and uh, um, thank you very much. <laughs>